Thank you all for being here on a Friday, and um, there's plenty of other things you could be doing. Uh, but I just skipped ahead to uh, the new laws that, that went into effect. I've got, really this is our comprehensive slide deck that goes through school safety um, from beginning to end. But I didn't want to run out of time knowing that we had an hour and miss all the new laws, which probably most of the leadership in here is like, well, what's going on that's new? Uh, so I will start with House Bill 3 that goes into effect uh, September 1st, um, if not a little sooner. The governor has signed it. And then if we have time after it, uh, we'll back up and go through the beginning of it. Um, but I will take questions here um, if you need. We are recording it, though, so don't, uh, don't use any specific examples from your school. You know, drop another school's name in if you have to, just to protect the innocent here. Um, but school safety, of course, is super, super paramount. Uh, this last legislative session, it was a big focus, of course, because of the Uvalde shooting. And before that, we had the Sutherland Springs shooting. And before that, we had the shooting at Santa Fe. And so these, 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 these massacres at our schools are becoming more prevalent, more disturbing. And so the Texas legislature took it up. Um, some would say they didn't do enough. Some said they did everything they can. I think there's still a lot more work to do um, addressing mental health and addressing other issues that, of course, are facing your students and families. Uh, but we'll, we'll start here with House Bill 3. And, what, and this all applies, for the most part, to school districts and charter schools. Uh, there are a few sections in the law that we'll look at that really only apply to the school districts but we think that it's still a good practice for you all to consider implementing at your charter school. Okay, so House Bill 3 amends um, part of Chapter 8 of the Education Code. Uh, and Chapter 8 of the Education Code is the, the chapter that governs uh, education service centers. Like we are, as a charter school, we're under Chapter 12 of the Education Code. Chapter 11 is the school district chapter. Chapter 8 is for education service centers. And it actually charges the service centers um, with, with acting as a school safety resource to assist schools in implementing and maintaining school safety. Um, I know that Region 10 has been doing that for a long time with their, their cooperative and with their administrative services that many of you are a part of, and they also have a school safety person they've had that's done a lot of training for you all, but now they are statutorily charged with doing it, not just as a service they're offering, but it is now a legal duty for them to be a resource for you. So I'm sure they'll be rolling out a lot more resources over the next few months as well as funding comes in, as rules are adopted, and as things become clear. So rely on your service centers. Um, go to them first. Um, even before you call us, call your service center. See what resources they have available for you before you spend money on outside vendors like us or others. Okay. It also amends Chapter 37 of the Education Code um, regarding peace officers, school resource officers, and security personnel. Now, some of you are thinking, well, Joe, we're a charter school. We're not under Chapter 37. Well, you're not under all of Chapter 37, but there are some provisions that you're under, and one of them is 37.081, which is if you're going to hire a peace officer, which is police, if you're gonna hire a school resource officer, security personnel, you have to follow the same standards that the school districts follow. And those standards are, it's the board's responsibility, by the way. Chapter 37 doesn't say that the superintendent can do this or that, it says the board controls security and safety the board controls deciding who may be contracted, who to hire for security personnel. The board decides if you're going to have a police department. The board decides if you're going to have a marshal. The board decides if you're going to have guardians. The board decides if you're going to contract with licensed peace officers or contract with licensed security guards. It's all the board. And so superintendents in the room, how many superintendents are here? Okay, other administrators? So rely on your boards. You've got to bring these matters to your board. It requires board action in order to be covered. And this is really important because when we're talking about safety and security, if there ever is an incident at your school, we also want to make sure you've complied with the law so you have the protections the law provides you as well. But the, uh, the board may employ or contract with security personnel. The board may enter into an MOU with your local police department, with your sheriff, uh, with your constable's office for the provision of commissioned peace officers at your school. One thing that's really cool that we got in here as, as some feedback we received from many of you was, Joe, when we go to the city, the cities want us to hire the police off-duty, and they want us to contract with the police off-duty, which is expensive, right? Because the off-duty police officers, that's, how they, that's kind of their side hustle. That's how they make extra money. So we wrote into the law, and they added it as an amendment, that if you're going to contract with the city, it's going to be an MOU, it's going to be an interlocal agreement, and it has to be at cost. It's a cost-sharing mechanism versus a markup of the profit, which is a pretty good fix. Hopefully the cities will follow it, but we'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. Um, we found a lot of success with the constables. Any, anyone in here using constables? 
a lot of our schools are using constables because the constables, uh, any, what does a constable do? Does anyone know? <laughs> you just kind of, <laughs> a massive no, I don't know what they do. So the constable's office is a law enforcement office in, in the state that is in our constitution, much like the sheriff, it, the sheriff is, and like the cities have municipal police powers. The constables actually act as the bailiffs for the JP courts. That's their constitutional duty, is to, to issue warrants and act as bailiffs for the justice of the peace courts. Well, they're elected, right? Each county has so many constable precincts that get elected, and they get a budget from the county, and they go and they do their JP work, but they got a lot of other authority. They're full peace officers, just like the city police, just like your sheriff's department is. And so, but, but they don't seem to have as much to do in reality because they're just, they, had, they don't have as much responsibility, that's right. So they tend to be more available and they're always looking to supplement their budget. So if you have issues with your city police or your sheriff, go to your constable's office because they have the ability to act in the same capacity and they seem to have a little more time in our experience. Uh, and they're looking for revenue to supplement their, uh, you know, building of a SWAT team or whatever else they're doing. In Bear County, we've got a bunch of constables and they're all completely armed up more even better than some of the local police and there's been some controversy around like why are our constables who have this JP function why do they have why do they need a an MRAM or one of these armored personnel carriers things like that and it's like well you know I don't know but it's kind of cool if you got it I guess um, but yeah check check out with the constable's office uh, one thing that's interesting that we're, we, we didn't get fixed but we're trying to get clarity on is is chapter 37 says if you're gonna hire a security guard they are supposed to be licensed peace officers if you're going, it says if you're going to employ a security guard that's armed, they have to be a peace officer. Well, one way of interpreting that is if you're going to hire security that's armed, they got to be cops, off-duty or whatnot, or they have to have a license affiliated with an actual police department. I don't know what the word employ means, though. Does employ mean hire as an employee? Does employ mean contract as an independent contractor? I don't know, and we've asked for clarity on that. We couldn't get it, um, but there is some issue there. So if you need specific guidance, talk to your lawyers. Uh, if, we're your, if we're your counsel, I think we are for most of you, call us. Um, but there is a little ambiguity in the law, and we try to get the legislature to clarify it, to say, hey, look, just let us hire armed security guards because they're licensed by the state. They may not be peace officers, but they at least have a license. Uh, but we actually got some pushback on that. Some people in the state said, look, you know, we don't want mall cops um, carrying guns in schools. They don't have the right training. And my retort was, well, wait, you don't want mall cops with security guard training, but you want us to have a guardian with hardly any training or a school marshal with maybe a little more training. Uh, so there's some incongruity there. Um, but alas, I did not prevail. Um, but we're going to go back next session or if there's a special session and try to get clarity there. Um, but for now, I think a, a good interpretation is if you're going to hire them as an employee, they've got to be peace officers. If we're going to sign an independent contractor agreement, maybe, maybe not, but we need to look at it very specifically, and that means you're going to want to get legal advice from us under privilege, not at a training session as to how to do that. But just be aware that that's an open issue. Okay. The law also says that you as a board get to determine the jurisdiction of a peace officer or a school resource officer. So the board gets to set their jurisdiction. Some school districts have police departments, right? And there's, I think, at least one charter school that has a police department. Um, the board sets their jurisdiction. Is their jurisdiction just limited to the campuses and school admin office? Is their jurisdiction limited to 1,000 feet from the school? Um, and actually, HB 3 says your board could decide their jurisdiction is all of your boundaries. Well, as a charter school, you, you have large boundaries. Your boundaries aren't one district. Your boundaries may be every district in the tri-county area. So your, your board's going to have to really think, where do we want them to have jurisdiction? Because the bottom line is you want them at your campuses, you want them at your events. Do you want them all around the county? No, you need them here at your schools. And so be thinking of that as a board. What jurisdiction do we want to give our peace officers, our school resource officers, or our security personnel? And we'll add that into your contract. That will go into your contract with the company or with the, with the peace officers as well to make sure that we've got that limited. Again, the board determines what the boundaries are and what the jurisdiction is and what their authority is. Um, and keep in mind, school security personnel, are they acting as disciplinarians on your campus? No, they do not do discipline. They're not doing restraints, right? They're not attending to suspension meetings and, and things like that. Um, they're there for security. And, and some schools get confused on that. So when you're setting your jurisdiction, you want to also tell them you're not there for discipline, you're there for security. Now, if there's an emergency, 
they're going to react, right? So I said, Joe, you said they're not there for restraints. Well, no, you're going to be doing your restraints in accordance with your restraint protocol. But if there's a threat to life or property and they need to act, they can act. But they're acting in a different capacity than you are as campus administrators and your disciplinarians are acting under your code of conduct. They have a very different role. And we want to make sure that they understand that role and that they're exercising appropriate restraint and acting within the jurisdiction that you give them. So we have this MOU provision. This is a great fix for us because I know a lot of local uh, law enforcement agencies were coming to you schools and you're saying, hey, can we contract with you? And they're like, yeah, at $100 an hour. Or, or sure, you, you buy, our, buy our new uh, uniforms and buy our new guns and everything and supply our entire police department um, and huge contracts. So we said, look, we want to work with the cities. We want to work with the counties because they have good training. They have, they've typically have um, police that have been through the academies. They're a higher caliber of peace officer normally but we can't afford it. So now we have it where the MOU, oh, wow, cool, okay. We have this MOU <laughs> in the form of an interlocal cooperative agreement. That's a 791 agreement. Uh, local, uh, Government Code Chapter 791 requires board action again. It brings it back to the board, but you can enter into that and they have to use a cost allocation method to address cost or fees incurred by the district, by you, or by the local law enforcement agency but that cost allocation method can account for all direct costs and expenses out of pocket, but it does not allow the agency, county, municipality to profit under the contract. So they're not, they're not supposed to be gouging and making money on this. It can be cost recovery, which we think is a big win. Um, now, it doesn't say they have to enter into the agreement with you. So one thing we're a little concerned about is you approach them and say, hey, we want to enter into this MOU with you. And they're like, well, there's no financial incentive for us. So what's in it for us, whereas before they could make some money on it or they would tell you to hire their buddies off duty and they'd make money. Um, the financial incentive's not there, but we hope that they'll act in good faith and realize that, that policing our schools and making sure our schools are safe is not just a school function, but it's a community function and we need their personnel and their experience. Now you will be enter, able to enter into agreements where you split the cost. You agree that, hey, we're going, you're gonna hire five new police officers, local police department, and we'll go ahead and split their cost of their uniforms, equipment, and training, 50-50 or 60-40, whatever you decide. But it's going to be an appropriate cost allocation that you're going to agree to. Um, it also opens the door for us to have additional state, federal, and private funding to help support this. So we're hoping that there'll be more money to be able to pay for these costs. Uh, and we'll talk in a moment. There is some money coming up that the legislature has given us for these programs, but it doesn't fully fund it. It's not adequate funding, in my opinion. Any questions? So here's the funding, the school safety allotment. And this is really, House Bill 3 was primarily about the school safety allotment, but a lot of these things got thrown onto it. So the school safety allotment is in Chapter 48. That's one of the funding sections of the Education Code. And it increases the school's annual allotment for purposes of improving school safety and security. So this is new money you're going to be getting, but you have to use it on school safety and security. You can't use it for other things. It's $10 for each student in average daily attendance. Is that a lot? No. But it's not zero, okay? So you get $10 for each student average daily attendance, plus you get one more dollar for each student in average daily attendance for every $50 by which your district's max basic allotment exceeds $6,160 prorated as necessary. How do I know how to calculate that? I don't. I'm going to look at Lisa Nyquist or someone with a finance background and say figure this out. But there will be, this will be added to the formulas that they have, and it'll be automatic, and of course you'll want to verify it, but it's all tying to your ADA. So if it's all tied to your ADA, what do we need to do? Make sure your kids are showing up, and talk to your families. Say, look, we've got more security money, and we've got more safety money, but it requires that you show up and we get our attendance up. I know a lot of you have probably been struggling with this, where pre-COVID your attendance rates may have been 96%. People were budgeting 96%, and a lot of you were budgeting for 96% again this year. And what was your average rate? 92, 93, 94, um, a big difference, right? Well, we got to get that up. We got to get that back up to 96, 97%. And let your families know that your attendance dollars, your attendance doesn't just drive our overall revenue, it also drives our security allotment that we're going to get. Also, there's an additional $15,000 per campus. Now, one thing we're watching here is campus, what does that mean? In the ISD world, campus means this school campus. 
But some of you, and how many of you have more than one campus at a site? A lot of charter schools will have like a K through eight campus and a nine through 12 campus or some other grade configuration all at one location. Does campus in House Bill 3 mean accountability campus or does it mean physical campus? Not sure, don't know yet. I'm hoping it means accountability campus because that's how TEA has them divided up. And TEA, is the, the, everything is based on the accountability campus for TEA, right? So I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that this means $15,000 per campus ID number. Um, by the way, sites don't count, right? It would be your campus numbers. Um, and so this could be a, a, a good windfall for charter schools if it's per actual campus ID. Now, funds allocated under this section, 48115, have to be used to improve school safety and security. So one of the things you're going to have is you're going to be audited. Your auditors are going to want to verify that you're actually using this money for safety and security. Well, what counts as safety and security? Good question. Um, they can be, this money can be used to improve school safety and security for costs associated with securing your facilities, so improving your infrastructure, installing fencing, the perimeter fencing, exterior door um, where the, the, the doors are hardened and you have to have put door numbering up, um, window safety, what is window safety? That's that protective film they want over certain windows, you know, the, the break proof glass and bullet resistant glass coatings, things like that. Um, you can use it for security upgrades, generally to purchase security cameras, um, emergency communications equipment, the panic technology, two-way radios, the silent panic alerts that are actually required now. We'll talk about that in a moment. You can also use it to provide for peace officers, private security officers, school marshals, guardians. So you can use it for these actual people that are going to be there. You can also use it for active shooter and emergency response training, prevention programs, providing mental health, licensed counselors, and mental health and behavioral personnel that are hired to help establish a more robust system at your school. So you can use this on your mental health professionals, counselors, psychologists, and other, other licensed mental health professionals uh, and behavioral personnel. So your behavior specialist may be able there. Now, this isn't gonna be for your general special ed, right? You're not, but it may help offset some of your general special ed costs where you have to have that behavior specialist there. You may be able to say, okay, your job is 80% SPED, 20% gonna be general mental health for our campus. And you may be able to use some of that money to kind of offset some things. We'll see how that plays out. But there may be some legitimate but creative ways to help get that there. Um, because by the way, are there enough people to hire right now if you, if you wanted to staff? No. Can you hire, find licensed counselors willing to work in a school setting right now? Very hard. Behavior specialists, very hard. Um, in fact, hiring police and, and, and peace officers is also very hard right now. But we have more opportunities here um, to be able to bring them in with some money. Um, you can also use this funds for um, restorative justice programs. That's pretty cool. Restorative justice is a big deal, right? It's, that's about prevention. It's about prevention, okay? You can also use it for suicide prevention, suicide intervention, and postvention. So again, they, the governor pushed and, and the legislature pushed for some more mental health resources. Now, we need to do a lot more, but this is a start. And they're actually talking about mental health this session for the first time in a long time. We actually have some action on it. Again, the beginning, we need a lot more, but it's a great start. You can also use it to hire a school safety director and other personnel to manage and monitor school safety initiatives and implementation. But if you're a small charter school or mid-sized charter school, you probably don't have enough work for a full-time safety and security director. So what do you do? Join a cooperative, work with the service center to see if you can have one person that's super qualified supporting multiple schools instead of everyone trying to hire their own, form cooperatives so you can get kind of pool your resources and be able to have more efficiency. Under Hospital 3, the TEA was also told that they are to kind of lead a Texas State School Safety Center, um, which is at Southwest Texas. I'm sorry, that's where I graduated from. They changed the name. I'm very upset about that still. <laughs> Texas State University, San Marcos, or whatever it's called. Um, they got the Texas School Safety Center there. But TEA or the Texas School Safety Center are supposed to pub publish a list of approved vendors. Now, here's the deal. Just because they're approved vendors, that means they've been vetted but it doesn't mean you can just go contract with them. You still have to go through your school's procurement process. It just means these, vetters, these vendors are pre-cleared, they're pre-vetted, but you still have to procure them in accordance with your policies. But you're allowed to use the money um, for these folks and for additional training, even training around um, those guardians and those marshals for persons authorized to carry a firearm on a school campus. 
So school marshal, school guardian training can be uh, an allowable use of this thing. And for technology and equipment. So lots and lots of things we can do on it, but you're going to have to show that it ties to school safety and security. Oh, sorry, virtual schools. Um, a campus that provides only virtual instruction is not included, so they don't get the safety and security money because I think, yeah, well, hey, we got a bunch of uh, virtual campuses. That's 15000 each. Well, you don't need a whole lot of uh, safety and security for a virtual campus. Or maybe you need more. I don't know. Um, but there you go. Uh, so this, is, this, this passed in the regular session. It's been sent to the governor. I believe the governor signed it or it takes effect September 1st if he doesn't. He's not going to veto it, right? He wouldn't do that. Okay. 37, well, he wouldn't do that. Well, maybe I should uh, hold my tongue here. Okay. We also have 370814. Again, this says the board shall determine the appropriate number of armed security officers for each campus. You have to have at least one armed security officer present during the regular school hours at each campus, but you can have one person covering multiple campuses. They just got to make their rounds. Um, there are exceptions here. If you can prove a hardship, then your board can make findings that there's exemptions and exceptions you can apply here. But you can have an armed security guard who has to be present during the regular school hours. It doesn't mean they're there all day, right? You can have one person that covers multiple campuses and kind of makes the rounds. So that's a little bit of flexibility. Okay. As mentioned above, the, to fulfill this new requirement in 3708.14, it's a peace officer, a school resource officer, a commissioned peace officer, a school marshal, or another school district employee who has completed the school safety training provided by a qualified handgun instructor certified in school safety. Um, and by the way, these handgun instructors, they have a course on school safety and school marshals. They have a program for that. Um, or someone who is uh, carrying a handgun on their person on school premises in accordance with written regulations or written authorization. That last one is the guardian plan, right? So the one above that, the school district employee who has completed the school safety training, that's the marshals. And the one that just says who's authorized in accordance with written regulations, that's a guardian. Because remember, school guardians, they actually don't exist in the law. We just made up the term school guardian to describe what the law says is that the board can authorize someone to carry on campus. Um, so marshals or guardians are both covered here. Okay, TEA is supposed to monitor the multi, your implementation, uh, and this is a big deal. Um, Everyone have their MEOPs in place? Fully in place? Did everyone do their three meetings in the school year? Okay. So this tells TEA that they are directed to monitor implementation um, and your actual initiatives around district safety and security, including your MEOPs, your multi-hazard emergency operations plans, as well as your safety and security audits. Now, you're supposed to do these regular safety and security audits and intruder detection audits, right? And every three years, you're supposed to do a comprehensive audit of all your campuses, and TEA has to monitor that. They also have to establish an Office of School Safety and Security separate from that Texas State University School Safety Center. TEA is supposed to establish a whole department dedicated to school safety and security. Um, so they're staffing up. They're going to ramp up their people to monitor and ensure you're implementing these things. And, and why is that? Well, TEA, I know I have it here somewhere. Well, we'll get to it in a second. TEA can appoint a conservator now. There's a new law in here that says, TEA, if you fail to follow the audit safety security standards, the MEOP, you're not having your three meetings a year, um, TEA has the ability to appoint a monitor at your charter school. I'm, so, I'm, not, I'm sorry, back up. Not a monitor, a conservator. TEA has the ability to appoint a conservator over your charter school. What authority does a conservator have? The conservator has all authority. The conservator can veto the superintendent CEO. The conservator can veto the board. So if TA appoints a conservator, they are effectively able to run your school. Now, in many cases, the conservator will sit back, and if you're doing the right thing, they're going to be there to help, and they're going to give guidance, and they're going to give advice, and they're going to let you work and do what you're doing. But if they disagree with you, they can step in and say, no, we're not doing that. We're doing something differently. Some conservators take a more hands-on approach, though, and they actually will be making decisions. So how many of you want to have a conservator? Anyone clamoring for that? No, but this law tells TEA we take this so seriously that if schools are not following these requirements, that they will have a conservator appointed. Now, in the past year and a half or so, because th these laws started changing after really 2018 Santa Fe um, and then the Sutherland Springs shooting of the church down in Floresville, um, 
these laws started really evolving 2019, 2021, um, and then, of course, the Uvalde massacre we had just over a year ago. Um, and as they started implementing these more stringent safety and security requirements, they kind of gave us a lot of grace, right? They said, look, we're not going to really enforce this. You've got to do it. The law says you have to do it, but we're not going to come down and enforce it on you because everyone's getting time. And then, gosh, we were in the middle of that pandemic. Thankfully, it's over, supposedly. Uh, over for now, I hope. Uh, well, over forever, not just for now. Um, but now they're telling us, now we mean business. Now you've got to take these things seriously. You've got to comply, and you've got to document your compliance because they will be doing audits and reviews to make sure you're complying, and they're staffing up with people to do that. They're supposed to go to each school district or charter school on a random basis, um, but you should be seen at least once every four years. So they're supposed to have a random basis, but once every four years, they're going to come and visit your school to check your facility access controls, your emergency operations procedures, your other school safety requirements, and also they, 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 they're going to try to line up as best they can with your ongoing safety and security audits. But once every four years, I mean, don't just rest back, right? Be involved, be active, make sure you're constantly complying. Because if you have something happen at your school, and it turns out that, look, if there's an incident at your school and there's another massacre, and gosh, I hope it doesn't happen, but if there is, they're going to come in and they're going to start second-guessing every decision you made. And if they find that you had doors were unlocked and that you didn't act properly, what's going to happen? It's game over. They're going to take your school over. They're going to shut you down. Um, because we've seen what's happened down in Uvalde when they found out the doors were propped open, right? And that people didn't get the training. Um, it's going to look bad. And you don't want to be in that situation because it'll also hurt your enrollment, right? Your parents, they're going to leave. They're going to leave your school. And if they leave your school, you're going to be out of business real quick. So don't just wait for that once every four-year deal. Keep on top of it. It's so, so critical that this is an absolute priority. TA is supposed to have a team assigned that will annually conduct on-site general intruder detections of schools uh, in the team's region. I think the region service centers will be doing that. They'll be assigned, a lot of this will be delegated to the service centers. I'm very, very positive of that. But they're going to be doing these ongoing audits, coming around and doing the intruder detection. Now, just like this last year, did everyone have their intruder detection? Everyone do well on that? Okay. Well, I know some schools did fine, some schools weren't, because we, we were called in um, by some folks like, hey, you got to really help your client out. They're not really doing well on this. I don't see anyone in this room that's in that boat. But um, make sure that you're taking those things seriously. They're, they are going to let you know they're coming. That way you don't just have a random intruder drill that you don't know if it's real or not. Um, they'll let you know what's happening. Um, but make sure your staff's trained on this. Make sure they have the resources and they have the tools. Um, and a big thing that I've noticed is substitute teachers are still a weakness, right? The subs don't have access, they don't have keys, and so people are, oh, the sub's going to run out to their car, so we're going to keep the door open for them. That's on the intruder detection audits I've seen over the last year. The biggest failure was substitute teachers because they weren't trained as well, they, they weren't at the in-services, they didn't have keys, and so people were kind of letting their guard down again and saying, well, the sub's got to run out, I'm going to prop the back door open for them. And man, that's the door that gets found during the intruder detection audit. So make sure your subs are teed up and trained as well. Oh, here it is. Uh, adds 37.1085. The TEA may assign conservator if you fail to submit to any of the required monitoring assessments, security or safety audits, or if you fail to comply with applicable safety and security requirements, or you don't address in a reasonable time period any of the concerns that they raise. Um, so they can, they can appoint a conservator here pretty easily. Now, this applies to school districts and charter schools. Charter schools, in Chapter 12, we have a revocation statute where they can revoke your charter for violations of health and safety. Now, in, this, in the DFW area, probably 2016, 17, there was a charter school that ha was under threat of revocation for not doing background checks. Do you all remember that? I'm not going to name names, but it was a big deal. They had Texas Rangers show up, and they locked that school down. They bolted the doors shut so they couldn't even open over background checks. TEA takes these things extremely seriously. So if they were going over fingerprints and background checks they were on safety and health and safety, what do you think they're going to do here if you're violating? They're going to shut it down. So that's how serious we need to take this. Okay, for the, how many SPED folks we have in the room? Any SPED folks? I know two. I got my two experts right here in the middle. Um, we do have to make sure that your MEOPs address students with disabilities. And, and that's not just, I'm not just talking active shooter here. I'm talking tornado drill. I'm talking fire drill. 
I'm talking train derailment. In the Houston area, we had charter schools that were evacuating because they had a petrochemical plant explode half mile down the road from the charter school. And you know what was really sad that was happening in some of these cases? Students with disabilities, where were they? They got left behind. They got left in the building. People were panicking. They were doing their evacuation. They were going into a hold status, and the students with disabilities got left behind. Intentionally? No, not intentionally, but it just became an oversight. Or someone had to say, oh, how do we get them off the second floor down to the first floor, and how do we actually evacuate them? And people are in, in, the, in, the, in the panic of that, in the instance of that emergency, they're just not thinking about it. So now your MEOP has to have a way to ensure the safety of all students, especially students and your employees that might have a disability. We had some teachers in one instance where we had teachers that, that needed help. They were in wheelchairs or they couldn't move as fast. Um, they, there's a teacher that had like a walker thing and she couldn't get out of the building that quickly. You've got to make sure that anyone, student or personnel with a disability or any other impairment is addressed. So what does that mean? You, you have a buddy system. Someone's assigned to help them out and you're doing a head count to make sure you're addressing safety for all personnel. It also has notification requirements here, where TEA, and the good news is TEA is going to develop model standards here, but notification for when there's been an incident, when there's an investigation, who you notify, how you notify, um, and the bottom line is parents want to know, right? Parents want to know when something's happened. In the San Antonio region about two, two and a half months ago, we had rumors that a student had brought a gun to school. And the school did everything possible that they could. It wasn't a gun. It was an airsoft little, well, it was a gun, but it was one of those little airsoft pellet guns, right? But rumors went crazy. They called the police. The student was detained. Um, the police showed up, cleared the scene, figured out it was one of those little airsoft pistols. But they put out communication to the parents that was very minimal following current guidelines. But the parents went crazy on social media. And so there were all sorts of rumors for the next two weeks about you know, ongoing threats, ongoing shooter stuff, because the parents demanded to know. And so we're like, hey, we just did everything we were supposed to do, but it still wasn't enough for the parents because the parents were showing up in mass and actually causing disturbances. Um, this, and this happened at an ISDN charter all within the same school year. The parents started showing up. There was one instance, uh, I think it was SAISD, makes, made the news, San Antonio Independent School District. You know, they had parents getting in a fight with the district police. Um, and the incident was under control, but the parents didn't believe it and the cops wouldn't let them into the building, and so the parents, like, overran the police. But, you know, this is pretty fresh in everyone's mind after seeing the police not going in, not taking care of business in Uvalde. The parents are like, well, you're not going to tell me I'm not going in that building. So TEAs recognize, you know, we've got to have some pretty clear standards for communicating so everyone understands that there's going to be real-time notification, electronic notification, text messaging, email. We still have to protect student privacy but let's have a system so parents can have more assurance to, to know what's going on, because the lack of information is what causes panic. Okay. House Bill 3 also has threat assessment law and safety, uh, safe supportive school program. So we got a little more support in here. They added another section and they amended other sections here where your boards now have to adopt um, a threat assessment and safe supportive schools team for each campus. Um, and you have to have more policies, more procedures, more training. And that team is responsible for developing and implementing the Safe and Supportive School Program. Everyone up to speed on that? Everyone know what that is? Threat assessment. It's a threat assessment team. It's to evaluate what's going on with a specific student, a specific incident, decide how to escalate it. The threat assessment team is going to overlap a lot with your discipline team. It's also going to overlap a lot with your special ed team because a lot of these students are going to be students with disabilities, they may have emotional disturbance or other disabilities, so there's going to be a lot of overlap. And I've had to tell um, many of you in this room, we've had these conversations. The threat assessment team works hand in hand with the campus administration and hand in hand with your special ed team um, because the laws overlap here, but they're not the same functions. They're different functions. They just happen to overlap a lot. So um, I know most of y'all are board members, but this is just a lot of work for your superintendents and your special ed administration and your campus administration have to implement the cross-coordination of all these teams. And I also have to tell people like, hey, you gotta take one hat off, in this hat you're the threat assessment team, then take that hat off, now you're the special ed ARD committee member, and now take that hat off, and now you're the disciplinarian implementing your code of conduct. But they have different rights, different requirements, different laws, and they're all mandatory. So there's a lot of juggling, a lot of plates that we're spinning in the air with this law. But um, 
it tells us we have to develop procedures of how to implement, how to, how to address concerning behavior, and how to follow all the other laws that we have to follow. So it tries to kind of make things have to be coordinated. Of course, it's really easy for them to say in a law, you have to coordinate all these other laws. Um, it's a lot easier to say than do. Um, you have to maintain threat assessment records until the student's 24th birthday. I mean, this is a big change here, right? 24th birthday. Um, so if you have a threat assessment on a student and that student graduates, how long do you keep records on a student after they graduate? Seven years. Okay, seven years. But for threat assessments, even if the student, um, if they, and this doesn't talk about graduating, it talks about a student under this section must be maintained in their school record until their 24th birthday. So how many of you were just uh, through middle school? Yeah, I was like, um, this is written from the perspective of traditional school districts where kids stay in one school system the entire time. But what happens when those students, when you're, you're K through eight and they, do you have to keep that to their 24th birthday even though they've left your school system? I think the answer is yes. Now we are, I, we've put in a request to TA, hey, when it says must be maintained in the student's school record, if they're not our student anymore, can we transfer that to their new school and the new school then has to maintain it? I think that that should be the answer, that these records follow the student from school to school. We have enough problems though getting the ISDs to give us all records under T-Rex, right? They're supposed to do that within 10 days, but they don't. Um, and they don't even give you their complete discipline file. You don't get their complete special ed file. You just get the bare minimum. Uh, but maybe this will help. But I think the way the law should work is that this should follow the student from school to school so that you're not having to maintain this for kids that have left you in eighth grade until they're 24. But to be determined on how this gets implemented. We're still trying to work through that. There is a risk assessment for suicide prevention, just like there could be a separate emotional disturbance evaluation under the IDEA for that same student, just like there could be a student discipline process for that same student, but yet we could also have a risk assessment for a student that's suicidal that could separately require a threat assessment. And it just depends on the circumstances. That's why I said you've got to take these hats off. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm in my, my IDEA special ed hat right now. Now I'm in my suicide prevention hat doing a risk assessment. Now I'm in my threat assessment mode, different hats, different standards, but not, it, they're not, it's not always going to be there, right? You could have it, we could have it where a student is suicidal and you do your risk assessment and you probably have a referral to special ed in case it's there and it would never get to a threat assessment. But if that risk assessment indicates that they may actually be a threat to others, what is that going to trigger? Then that's going to trigger the threat assessment. So just remember, there's a lot of overlap and a bleed over in all these processes and you've got to be cognizant that there could be multiple steps and multiple processes you have to go through. Ah, exhausting, right? Thankfully, board members, uh, other than adopting a policy, you, you, know, you don't have to actually do the work. Yes, sir. Why would that threat assessment not be sent to a mental health person or something like that rather than sure people if it's a threat to the public? Well, because under our school laws, those records are confidential under federal law. So federal law makes these records confidential and we can't share them with a third party without parental consent, unless there's an emergency. And so if there's an emergency, there's an emergency exception and it's called FERPA, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, says that we have to safeguard students' confidentiality and we can't share it unless there's a court order, unless there's parental consent, a subpoena, and there's an emergency exception. So if there's an active emergency, like an active school shooting happening, we don't have to say, let's get a subpoena and then we'll share it with you police. No, if there's an active emergency, an active emergency, then you can go ahead and show those records. But it doesn't allow us to share them in advance. That's the issue. So th those records are bottled up with us and we can't share them with general mental health professionals in the community or with police or with others until that incident happens. And that's frustrating. That you 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 got to yeah. You've got you've got to get the parents' consent. Yeah yeah. So what happens in that case? That's a great question. Is it's a great question and it's very frustrating. But you're gonna part of your risk assessment that we're gonna be doing that we brought up over here is you're gonna have a meeting with the parents and you're gonna try to talk the parents into giving you consent 
so that you can bring a full spectrum of services and supports for the community so you can make those referrals to the community resources. And it could be a church group, it could be a mental health group in the county or city you're in, it could be elsewhere. Um, but what if the parents say no? If the parents just refuse and say no, um, then they can kind of block us. And sometimes they do, right? Sometimes the parents are in denial. But what we can do is continue to make those referrals. And, and what if a parent, what if you really believe, what if, and this is not necessarily an answer to everything, but what if you really believe that a student's mental health is in peril where they are a risk to themselves or others? And you go to the parent and you tell the parent, hey, we need to get help. This student needs mental health care. And the parent refuses. You make a CPS report, Child Protective Services, because that is medical neglect. If you believe that that student is, is in danger and not getting the health care that they need and the parent refuses, then you make a CPS referral. Now, where does it go from there? Sometimes nowhere because CPS is overwhelmed and they're not going to, unless it's an active emergency, they're not going to respond. But you make that CPS referral and you keep making that CPS referral again and again and again. And, you, and by the way, you don't just have to make that CPS referral. Um, how many, your county probably has a mental health crisis number. You can call them the county mental health crisis number. I've had to do this on some, with some friends and some family even. Call the mental health crisis number and they have mental health professionals that will respond with police. And they usually have police that are trained in mental health and they'll respond. And if they deem that a, that a person is a danger to themselves or others, what do they do? They'll take them into a mental health detention. They'll, it's not an arrest, it's a mental health custody situation where they bring them to a hospital to be evaluated. I started talking earlier about mental health being an issue. We started talking about mental health this session. We've not done enough. Our mental health system statewide is a failure. It's abysmal. It doesn't work for children. It doesn't work for adults. But we're, we're starting to have these conversations. But we need to make sure that we're letting our elected officials know this needs to be a bigger conversation. Um, I wasn't alive back in the 50s and 60s and 70s, but I remember I have heard they used to have a lot of mental health hospitals, state hospitals for the mental health. Anyone remember those? Anyone ever been in one? <laughs> I mean, just for visiting, right? Um, <laughs> just, to, just to clarify that. Um, why did they shut them all down? They, got, they all got shut down, right? Why? They were inhumane. There was a lot of abuse happening in them. We, we, we need facilities again. There aren't any anymore, or there are not enough of them. There's a, mental, there's, a count, there's a state mental health hospital in Kerrville, Texas, that I think the state spent $60, $70 million on it, brand new, state-of-the-art facility. It's not open. It's not open. It's, it's built. They can't staff it with psychologists and psychiatrists and nurses. They can't, they can't staff it. So they just keep it closed. So we, we need resources. The state, our, our elected officials need to pour in the resources here because each of these students, right now, the students you're serving that have these mental health issues, if we can address it, we can help. But if we can't address it, they age out and they go out into the population. So vote, contact your elected officials, and don't be relentless. Don't let them, don't take no for an answer. Okay, we also have to provide DPS and local law enforcement with an accurate map of each campus and each school building and your floor plans and site plans, access control and exterior door numbering. And you have to give an opportunity for local law enforcement and, and DPS to do a walkthrough of each of your campuses. This is really critical for charter schools. They know the ISDs, but they often don't know that you're a public school. Invite them out, have your floor plan, build, build a binder. And we've, some of our schools have done this. They've got a binder, a physical binder and an electronic binder. They say, hey, Police chief, will you send your team out? We've got a binder for you. And also, here's a USB drive where everything's electronic so you can share it with your team. And have that as part of your emergency operations plan. But invite them out. Let them see your school. Um, some of our schools are letting them actually come and do drills over the summer so they can use your schools for practicing because they need to get the training as well. Um, but the law says that we have to make that invitation happen and we have to give first responders these documents anyways. Um, but it's always been a best practice, but now you have to do it. Uh, the School Safety Center and DPS is supposed to give you resources on safe storage of firearms um, and how to distribute them um, if you have a marshal or if you have guardians, things like that. Um, and also training on safe storage of firearms in the home, so not just in school but in, in your homes, and how parents and guardians can prevent children from accessing firearms. Um, 
the scariest moment in my practice of law happened probably 2016, 17. We had a situation where a student left home early in the morning and was on their way to school. Mom and dad got up, saw that their, their son had left early in the morning, and what did they see was open? The gun safe was open. What did they do? They called the campus principal. Thank goodness that campus principal, and this is an ISD, had given every family, that principal had given them the cell phone number. Every family, and that principal said, you call me, you text me 24-7. That's not normal, right? Especially not in the ISD world. But that principal had given every family their cell phone number, and that family saw the gun safe was open. They called the principal. The principal calls the police, calls the district police, calls the city police, and they intercepted this young man one minute from the campus. And what they found is he had a shotgun, he had an AR-15, but in the school he'd also placed several handguns around the school up in the ceiling tiles in the bathrooms. One minute away, one minute away, and it was all because you know, they didn't have safe firearm storage at home. Well, now the state's supposed to give us training for families on safe storage of firearms in the home. Now, one thing, I don't think it happened this session, but there were bills proposed that if a parent allows their child whether in, in, or, or a member of their family to get access to a firearm, that they could be held liable if, if there's a school shooting. Okay? And so I don't think it passed because that, you know, some people don't like that stuff, but that's coming, right? So make sure your, your families are educated. You know, we're not, we're not going to get rid of guns in Texas. That's not likely to happen here um, anytime soon. Um, but we can train our families on safe storage and security of firearms in the home and at school if you have marshals. And also on how parents can help prevent child from accessing firearms. Um, look, I have some firearms I inherited. I've never bought one, but I've inherited some from family. They're not in my home. I don't keep them in my home. You know, they're, they're, they're stored away in a warehouse, probably get broken into and stolen. Um, and they're also in that warehouse, and they're completely disassembled. You know, that's how paranoid I am about it. Now, some people are active shooters. They enjoy, or not active shooters. They're, they're active. <laughs> wow. Bad, they're, they're, they're enthusiasts, and they go to the range every weekend or whatever, and they, they want to have quick access to it. But there's a lot of risk that goes along with that, okay? And they need to make sure that they're ensuring that those things are kept safe and secure, and their children don't have access to them. All right. Uh, there's more safety and security requirements here. Subchapter J, gosh, we're getting down there to the J's, although J is one of my favorite letters. Subchapter J requires public schools to ensure each school facility complies with the school facility standards. And so, you know, we are not under the school facility standards that ISDs are under. They have a whole bunch of laws that apply to them. But we are under the safety and security standards um, that address what, what levels of security do you have to have at your campus. And, and the, this is new law, by the way. Um, the statute here is new, but the commissioners also recently adopted new standards that talk about what your facilities have to have and what, alter, what, what alterations you're going to need to make to your buildings. But it requires that each school facility will eventually comply with the school facility standards the commissioners adopted that we'll talk about in a moment. There are exceptions, though. If we can show that the school's age, physical design, or location is not possible, if we can show that if we were to make the improvements that it would defeat the purpose of the facility, if there's not enough funding available, supply chain obstacles. So there are some exceptions they've given us. But man, those exceptions, they can't be the rule. Those got to be the exceptions here, right? And, and you've got to have alternative methods of compliance with safety and security standards. And it authorizes the commissioner to tell you, to direct you to use your money for certain improvements if you're not doing it. So it gives the commissioner a lot more authority to step in and kind of compel you to take action if you're not doing it yourself. Um, and we're going to talk about um, some other new laws here in a second once we get through House Bill 3, because um, not all these laws are coordinated. Some of them are a bit overlapping. Um, school visitors. Um, House Bill 3 also gave you in Chapter 38, that's Health and Safety, Chapter 38. We're, all, we're under all of that as a charter school. But it gives you the ability to eject any person from your property if they fail or refuse to identify themselves or they, 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 they appear to not have any legitimate reason to be on district property. I don't know why they needed that in statute. We already had that authority. Um, and, and has anyone ever criminally trespassed someone? Yeah, it, it happens in schools. Like if you get someone that's unruly or they're disturbing the education environment, you can trespass them. Um, I don't think we needed this in statute, but they gave us that authority. So that you, if anyone fails to identify themselves on school property or you feel they have no legitimate grounds or reasons to be on your property, you can kick them off your property. 
Uh, just in case you needed to know, yes, you can use bonds for that. So if you need bond help, reach out to our partner, Janet Robertson. Um, we have bond counsel in the firm, full bond services, a little advertisement for her. Um, but you can use your bonds now clearly for construction of school buildings with safety and security. Um, not only safety and security improvements, but also equipping with, with, with equipment like the panic alert technology, running the, uh, the cabling through the ceilings for that panic alert technology. You can use bond proceeds for all of that stuff. Um, there's supposed to be your sheriff of your county with a population of less than 350,000. That's not you all, but the, uh, cause you're all, most of y'all are Dallas County here. Um, but there has to be a, the sheriff is supposed to have a meeting on school safety at least annually, um, and, and kind of bring everyone together to talk about how we're going to do better at s safely and securing our schools. Um, timeline, let's see. Here's some school district only provisions. Um, there's more training again. School districts now have mandatory mental health training. This does not apply to charter schools, but I'm throwing it up there because I think it's a really good idea to comply with it, even though it do, and, and the money can be used on this, even though the statute doesn't apply. But in the ISD world, all district employees who interact with students must have a complete, complete mental health training program, instructing them on how to recognize and support children with mental health issues, substance abuse issues, or other issues that may pose a threat to school safety. Um, we already have a requirement to do suicide prevention training, now we have to do mental health training, and we also, the, the districts have to do substance abuse training. Um, again, not, not directly applicable to charters, but we think it's a really good idea to take these modules. Um, TEA has to provide an allotment to each district to assist in complying with the mental health training requirement. So there is more funding for the districts. I don't think that funding will be available for us. Because this statute doesn't apply to charters. We think it's a good idea, but if, if the stat doesn't apply, I don't know that the money will be there with it, uh, but we can always ask. Oh, and this does count as credit towards your edu educators continuing education requirements. So if you go through that training, it'll probably count for your board member training, it'll probably count for your officer training, so you can kind of double up on that. Um, the, the ISDs have a requirement that 25% of their people have to complete it by 25-26, 50% by the 26-27 school year, and they have until the 28, 29 school year to have 100% completion. You know, I don't know why people would wait. I just get it all signed up. I'm, I'm sure there'll be online courses here for this. Just, just get it knocked out. Ah, here we go. I, I didn't even recognize this part of it, but it addresses the question earlier. Um, their discipline records and threat assessments have to be provided to the school, new school. So when they transfer, they have to provide it. So that's a good add-on. I actually had missed this, but it's in my PowerPoint. I'll have to thank my paralegal for throwing it in there. But look, the law already says they have to provide the records, and they already aren't doing it. Um, so we'll see if they actually enforce this. Okay, we also have Senate Bill 838. Do I have like a minute left or five minutes? I was going to say five. People are starting to clap their phones out. <laughs> I thought this was really engaging. I told everyone, y'all, y'all, we we made a deal, guys. We made a deal. We made a deal that we made a deal that I'm on camera that you would quietly exit and I would pretend to keep going, but y'all keep making noise here. And, and Dr. Johnson from Nova Academy, he's definitely still in he's he's definitely still in his seat. He's definitely still in his seat. He's, 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 he's staying here till 4 o'clock because our invoices are getting paid on time. I know that's happening. I think it's just because there's no speaker Sure, sure, sure. I'm, look, I'm not offended, guys. Not, not much. Okay. Okay, Senate Bill, we'll finish up. Senate Bill 838 is Alyssa's law, and this talks about providing silent panic alert technology in your classrooms. I, the one thing I want to talk about here is there's other law that says you have to have communication devices in every classroom, like a telephone line. I've had this, I had 10 schools ask me this in the last month. Well, if we have a telephone line, that's our silent panic technology. I said, no, 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 it's not. It's not. You have to have that communication device. And, and it's usually not a big deal in the school buildings because most school buildings have that. The portables is where we have the issues. My, my watch just told me I'm done. I don't even know how that even started. Tony must have texted me a clock here. But you have to have, Alyssa's law says you have to have silent panic alert technology in every classroom. Um, 
yes, you have a little bit of time to get it done. Because if everyone had to procure it right now, there would be a run on supplies and there's not enough. Um, but prioritize it if you can. Uh, and by the way, how are you going to procure it? If, you're, if everyone's going out for bid on their own, uh, go to the service center. I'm sure they have a cooperative, and they probably have vendors pre-bid out so you can actually get it efficiently through the cooperative. And, uh, and Tony promises that the co-op's not charging you 2% premium on that, right? No, they're not. Maybe a 1% premium, not 2 Okay, who knows? there's something, but go to the cooperative so you can efficiently procure it. But you have to have that silent alert technology in by 2526 um, under Alyssa's law. Uh, oh, yeah, this is where it says it has to be both panic buttons and other communication devices. And if you have a phone in the classroom, that doesn't count. And, oh, my gosh, that's it. <laughs>